So thanks so much for a wonderful talk. Um, and let's move on to our second speaker of the day, who is Professor Alexander Morozov of Rutgers. Um, Alex, feel free to All share. Right. Your... Yes, so I will uh, thank you and I will share my screen. Yeah, and he will be telling us about uh, the biological physics of chromatin uh, structure mediated gene regulation in yeast and fly. So welcome, Alex, and the floor is yours. All right, thank you so much, Sonia, for this for, for this invitation. And, um, you know, it's a 25 minute talk. So I thought I would give you an overview of what's done in this field and sort of suppress uh, mathematical details, uh, which we can talk about later. So my background is in physics. So what I do is modeling of chromatin. And uh, I will go over today about uh, some of the key questions, some of the answers we found, and uh, some of the experiments that people do when we work with them and, and the models that we have been developing. So let's see. So let me start from the beginning and just show you a eukaryotic cell inside uh, such cells of which come in many different types. There's a nucleus. So you can see that it's a, just a textbook picture, right? There's a nucleus and there's chromatin that they show like um, a little bit like spaghetti right inside the nucleus. So these cells, uh, just to remind you, are from a few microns to maybe a hundred microns in diameter. So this is uh, the scales and the, and the nucleus is still smaller. So, if you uh, look at how much DNA the cells pack inside, then you actually get um, sort of a, in, in a somewhat shallow way, but you get astronomical numbers, right? So we all know that in human cells, there are about six feet of DNA if you stretch it out. It's not a single piece, of course, it comes in, in chromosomes. Then you multiply by uh, what I believe is about uh, 30 trillion cells in a human body. And then if you were to make such a long chain, right, it would be really astronomical, right? It would, um, it would serve to circle the earth 2.5 million turns. So one of my students made this cartoons, former students, and <laughs> I think it's fun to show them. And uh, even if you wanted to go from the earth to the sun and back, you can do 300 turns. So this polymer somehow is packed, however, into the volume of your body that's, that's not astronomical, right? So how does that work? Well, you could say that's not a good idea because um, no one is stretching DNA inside cells, right? They probably collapse uh, in some sort of a polymer fashion, right? You know that uh, you, make, you can make random coils with polymer and people in polymer physics talk about that. However, if you sort of sketch out the estimate of size of a polymer random coil, it's still too big by about a hundred, uh, maybe 10 to a hundred times. But the, the whole question is moot, however, because we know that cells uh, don't allow uh, the very important, the key DNA polymer to collapse into a random coil. So it's carefully managed, right? The DNA is carefully managed on multiple scales and here is a, a picture from um, an old review by Gary Felsenfeld and, uh, and co-authors uh, that people like to show. It's a little bit maybe too neat for what's going on in a cell, but it does show you the sort of the multi-scale and almost fractal structure, right? In the sense that you have uh, naked DNA at the lowest scale, then you have a bits, of an, a bits on the stream, right? So there are nucleosomes that are special proteins, histone octamers, and DNA goes on around, uh, and around these nucleosomes. So it's packaged like this, and then this becomes a fiber that's packaged in its stead, and so on and so forth, right? Until we have a, something like the entire mitotic chromosome on the bottom. So we will mostly focus on the level, on, on the level where you just packaged it into the nucleosomes. It's not to say that the higher order, um, higher order structure is not important. It's very important and is being actively studied. But it's just that the, this level is amenable to biophysical modeling, and uh, I would like to focus on that for this talk. All right, so you can actually see this level of, uh, of chromatin compaction in, uh, under the electron microscope. That's what uh, we have on the bottom. 
this is an actual um, electron micrograph. Each uh, dark spot is a nucleosome, and you can even see the traces of DNA. And because the uh, uh, ion concentration is low, it's lost all this potentially functional higher order structure, and it just sort of opened up uh, as, a, as, a, as just a jumble of fibers. All right, so what is this nucleosome that I brought up a couple of slides ago? People have beautiful structures of that. And um, turns out it's um, not one chain, but eight chains. It's an octamer of polymer, I mean, of proteins that comes together and forms a spool. You can see uh, the side view and the view from above, like if you cut through the middle and looked for, uh, 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 from above, you know, this is like a flat, flat spool. DNA on this picture is in white. And uh, you can see how uh, the DNA helix is bent uh, into a left handed super helix, as it's called. And uh, almost two turns of it go around uh, a single histone octamer. So this is sort of the, the basic, I guess, biochemistry or biophysics uh, of, of a single nucleosome. Uh, and you might already think at this stage that uh, how stable is the structure, you know, what happens to the ends of DNA and so on. But if you take a static snapshot with uh, X-ray, right, and there are high resolution structures this day, and, and there are several, you have 147 or 146 uh, base pairs of DNA, and they are bent into a superhelix that you see like this. And then the, you can imagine a linker DNA to the next one and so on. So these nucleosomes are everywhere. There is another level of complexity that you have uh, on the level of uh, modification of both DNA bases and histones. This is not the focus here, but it's unavoidable to, to talk about this, right? Because, um, because things like this happen. For example, this is an illustration of just one pathway where, you know, a number of complex uh, biochemical machines, including chromatin modelers, which are specifically you know, evolved to, uh, to manage nucleosomes, to displace them, to unfold them, and so on. So, um, so this so-called Swiss-Neat histone amodeling complex comes together with uh, other machines in this scenario, and it basically establishes a locus of transcriptional repression at a methylated locus. So when DNA is methylated, it's known that the genes there are suppressed uh, most of the time. And this is like one hypothesis for which machine would be responsible for that. So DNA is just, uh, besides being you know, a mechanical object that's amenable to studies by polymer physics methods, it's also obviously a biochemical uh, object and there's a site of many modifications uh, which come well on the DNA side and then the histone side. Histones, I remember the histone octum is what makes a nucleosome. All right, so what about gene regulation? I like showing this picture because it's very complementary. So one is the top one is bioinformatics, right? Meaning I give you a piece of DNA and you should find regulatory sites. Right, so these sites in a fly or, or in human come in modules. And this is one of the modules that I'm highlighting here. It means they come together, um, they basically come together and separated by non-regulatory DNA. And uh, you might wanna write a program, for example, that finds these clusters of sites, and then you could argue about what binds there and what the biological function is. But in fact, what you have a 3D view, this is this panel B, so where you have a chromatin that has to be managed somehow, you have transcription factors and cofactors, you have the, you know, the RNA polymerase and so on and so forth. And all of this works in an orchestrated manner to initiate gene expression, for example. And um, I want to also point out that from the point of view of biophysics, this is not a very plausible picture on the bottom because it just basically shows for I guess because it's easier to, to draw things like this, that nucleosomes are completely removed from a large stretch of DNA. And this actually never happens because nucleosomes are, uh, histones are positively charged and, and DNA is negatively charged. So they always are in your way. They always try to form. And uh, we will see that in the actual data, um, you know, a few slides down. So the machinery does not have the luxury of working 
with naked DNA if it wants to. You know, you could spend this much energy, it's not forbidden, but it's just too much for the cell. So most machines actually learn to manipulate nucleosomes, go around nucleosomes, including the polymerase, uh, and not perturb chromatin uh, as much as shown in this picture. Okay, so what is you know one of many scenarios for how chromatin can affect gene regulation? So on the level uh, at which I'm focusing, which is basically bits on the chain, so you might have a transcription factor binding site shown here in red, which cannot get to, to its site, right? The transcription factor cannot get to the site because it's buried in the nucleosome. So in order to be able to bind, the nucleosome may have to be unfolded, but this is uh, too much energy as, uh, as I argued, the cost is considerable, or it may do something, uh, something like this. It may just move, move aside, uh, which is something that people model, but it's, uh, you, you may imagine that uh, that may be costly as well to take and sort of move it by one base pair at a time so that the transcription factor now binds and now you have an uh, active, you know, active RNA production. So this is not something that I advocate in particular. This is one of many pathways. And uh, I guess what I want to say, uh, uh, one of many potential pathways, what I want to say is uh, whatever these pathways are, and there may be multiple ones, they have to work within the limits of biophysics and not, and, you know, they, they shouldn't cost too much free energy. That's, that's the point. So, well, um, some of you may uh, not have seen this before. How do you even know where the nucleosomes are? So it turns out that you can map them by the millions. You know, you can map them genome-wide. Uh, and th this is from our review from a number of years ago. And uh, these days, you basically take a chromatin fiber and uh, use so-called uh, MNAs, micrococal nuclease, which is an enzyme that will bind somewhere on the naked DNA and will digest all the non-covered DNA, and uh, it will even try to eat into nucleosomes, and given enough time, it will actually digest everything. So the time or the concentration of the seminase exposure is an important parameter. So, and uh, these days, you know, once you get this nucleosomal DNA that's isolated by MNAs digestion, you go on the right side of this picture, and you basically just uh, do sequencing of the whole DNA sample. You know, you wash off your histones, you purify DNA, you sequence it, and then you map it onto the FNS genome, right? Usually you do it on an organism where the genome is, uh, is known. So you just, uh, I, I will talk today about yeast and fly. Uh, and uh, before, you know, even uh, as recently as 10 years ago, you could also do a microarray and then uh, get basically logi values. Uh, but but these days it's mostly sequencing. So this is my overview of this experiment. This is sort of a high level physicist's abstraction of, of what's going on without any biochemical details. So this is my starting point. And here I mix in my micrococal nucleus, right? So it will start uh, digesting away on the DNA that's, uh, that's susceptible to attack. So it binds, there is this certain, uh, certain stretches of DNA where it likes to bind, but uh, and it spends more time digesting um, some nucleotides than the others, but eventually, you know, it will uh, bind somewhere and it will digest away the naked DNA. And what you have, if you washed it away, you know, after X minutes, is something like this, where it's mostly mononucleosomes, but sometimes actually linker DNA is intact, right? So in the middle, I, I left it on purpose. So it can be a longer piece. So now you just need to remove the histones and you have a DNA sample like this. And of course you can do a size selection on the gel and you can actually look for dinucleosomes. If you lose low MNAs concentration or mononucleosomes, uh, people mostly use higher concentration. We'll see some dangers of that. But if you, uh, the standard way to proceed is use uh, higher MNAs concentration and, uh, and and focus on mononucleosomes. Then you just basically sequence the whole thing and map it to the genome. Um, this is just an abstract view where the intensity is the number of reads, right? There, there are many, there, there may be like poly A tracts and so on where you may map many reads and mapping reads, uh, these DNA pieces that you sequenced uh, is non-trivial, but uh, 
nowadays it's part of a standard pipeline. So there's one interesting biophysical question you can ask at this point. So these nucleosomes, you know, even from basic physics, you know, the un unwrapping DNA on the ends is uh, just a few kT, right? So it's it's not perfectly stable like you you, you saw in a crystal structure. In fact, nucleosomes are dynamic, and uh, moreover, this dynamics is coupled with the MNA's digestion, in the sense that even if it wasn't dynamic, it would eat into the nucleosome. Uh, so the two two effects are coupled, and no one could uh, decouple them easily. But people saw, you know, that it's sort of a single nucleosome, a single position gives an ensemble of DNA fragments that the MNA is protected. They, they are not all the same as you would maybe naively expect at zero temperature, right? Uh, but there's an ensemble. And as a result, if you map the center of each piece or like where each piece covers DNA, you know, so-called nucleosome occupancy, you sort of see that it's uh, not a perfect uh, rectangle or not a perfect spike, right? But there's a washed out uh, quality to it. So, if you plot the histogram of lengths of the pieces that you get from your putative mononucleosomes, you get you do get a tail that extends into what's less. Remember, the nucleosome particle is 147. And here, in this particular histogram, you have a tail that goes uh, below 140 even. So, but people would uh, tend to dismiss this because uh, they would say, you know, MNAs ate into, into these particles, and it's an artifact of the experiment. So we'll come back to that, but now let me show you a few results uh, on fly. Uh, the previous one was on east, but it's not important from the point of view of modeling. So this is something we did a few years ago with a lab in Holland. And what they looked at is exact this, this exact experiment I described to you on fly embryos in this particular case. But uh, they used high and low nucleosomes. So it was selected for mononucleosomes. Uh, mononucleosome sized particles. It was a uh, standard MNAs experiment, but at two MNAs concentrations. And what, uh, so here I'm just showing you a, a, a typical locus. It's not, um, you know, locus of any interest. We see, we see this uh, genome wide. And what I want you to see is that, for example, at HSP26, you have fewer nucleosomes in the red, you know, the upper at high MNAs than at low MNAs. So if you look at it sort of carefully uh, at several loci, you see that there are more nucleosomes. There seems to be uh, more, uh, more nucleosomes in blue than in red, right? You can see it around the HSP26 and around position 9366, so where HSP67BB is. So what's, what's going on there? So let's look at it in another way. So you can look at, instead of looking at a genome locus, you can basically just look at a heat map uh, and, and plot, like align each gene by its transcription start site or termination site uh, so that they're all lined up. There is no dephasing. And each uh, row here is a gene. And uh, the heat is basically the number of nucleosomes, the relative number of nucleosomes. So, you know, colors like red show there's a nucleosome. So an MNA is high on the left, and one end just means a single nucleosome. So we're still looking at mononucleosomal data. So zero is where the transcription start site is. And you can see that there is some blue, which is nucleosome depleted regions, which disappears uh, when the MNA's concentration is low. So this is, and this is true for TTS as well. And we're looking actually, so this is looking, uh, basically on the upper part of each graph. And uh, what's going on here is that this is sorted by gene expression. So we have a gene expression. This is a uh, bimodal. And some genes are expressed and in, in the peak on the right. And some genes are uh, less expressed or silent. And this is the peak on the left. And the vertical dashed line in the lower histogram is the horizontal white line, which separates active from inactive genes. Okay, so there are two messages here. First of all, the presumably nucleosome depleted regions that people uh, talked a lot about is actually filled with nucleosomes that you can catch at low MNAs concentrations and they are more fragile or unstable in some way, but they're there. And second of all, that there's a big difference in how uh, active gene chromatin structure is organized versus inactive gene. 
right? You see a lot more order. You see uh, self-organization with active genes that sort of disappears or almost disappears on the lower part of each of the four panels, especially the TSS ones. So nucleosomes, and that's, you know, in hindsight, nucleosomes should be everywhere because they're so easy to make. Uh, just to give you an idea, it's tens of kT, right? It's like 40 kT favorable to make a nucleosome. So they will always form. So uh, you see the same uh, message on DNA's uh, one hypersensitive site. So if you line up, not uh, TTS or TSS, but hypersensitive sites, this is the same data, just lined up differently. If with MNAs high, you see a, a depleted region that people always notice. And this is sorted by, so it's a nicer picture. It's sorted by the length of the hypersensitive site, right, from short to long. But it's filled in with arrays. Uh, at MNAs low, you can, you can catch this. So that's interesting because this uh, shows you what I was telling you about. Um, which is nucleosomes are everywhere and all the other actors like transcription factors or RNA polymerase have to work with them somehow. Uh, and in fact, it's uh, something about this is known. And uh, part of it is the second effect I wanted to talk to you about, which is nucleosome unwrapping, right? So I already introduced it, but I said it's mixed in with uh, MNA's setup artifact, right? So this... Um, so if you take this and do MNAs, the MNAs essay on it, uh, which I mentioned, uh, people will tell you, oh, you just uh, left it there a couple minutes too long and it ate into your nucleosome. So, the, so, so what do they want from this data? So this was the state of the art for years. However, uh, John Widom, a number of years ago, uh, uh, John, John Widom was a prominent chromatin biologist. Uh, did an in vitro experiment. So he was worried about nucleosome unwrapping and he basically took a 601 nucleosome. This is a very stable nucleosome. So he did it in vitro on a short piece of DNA and he put restriction enzyme sites inside uh, at different positions with respect to the axis, right? So because you expect the, the ends to be more open than the center, right? So he basically recorded uh, the action, you know, the, the, when a section enzyme gets in, it cuts DNA, and that can be accorded. And you can basically see it as the height of these bars on the bottom. And you can see that it um, actually gets in quite far into the nucleosome on the ends. And only if you are close, so you are, you are basically at 74 um, at the center. And even close to the center, there were some cutting events. So the nucleosome, despite being very stable, the 601 was chosen for how much it likes. You know, it's a special DNA sequence that's not found in the genome. And if you mix it in with histones, it basically likes to make this nucleosome with this particular sequence and it will be stable, much more stable than the typical genome nucleosome. Nonetheless, it opens up, as you can see, even as much as 30, 40 easily. You know, the, the bars become lower, but nonetheless, you know, on the edges, it's quite open and then it gets, um, you know, less accessible, but still non-zero accessibility. Um, just, just, yeah. just to let you know, Alex, about three, three minutes left. That's, that's fine, because I will skip my, my modeling. <laughs> so we have developed models of nucleosome arrays, um, which have all this, uh, all these things in them, including the unwrapping that I was just talking about. You can mix in transcription factors and so on. You can put in sequence specificity, potential barriers, barriers and wells, and even interactions uh, between neighboring particles, which is something uh, that nucleosomes do. The, this effective interaction is needed for higher order chromatin structure. So let me just sort of fly over this and say that DNA pieces bind, uh, bend in different ways depending on their sequence. And this should be a contributor, right? So some DNA uh, segments should be uh, uh, harder to bend than others, and this is a factor. Another one is that when something is bound, it may uh, interfere with nucleosomes by presenting a, an effective barrier uh, to them. This is my cartoon here. And this is something that we find is important um, to actually produce in vivo data. So silent genes on the left, they're defaced and we don't have much signal as you saw from before. 
and the active genes uh, they get phased by this machinery and this is shown here as some sort of potential that you have to put into if reduce the data so let me show you uh what's going on with so with the data on the left you have nucleosomes this is now mono and dinucleosome signal in the fly uh in drosophila and uh, on the on the upper part you have active genes and you cannot use a sequence dependent model uh just a sequence dependent model uh and they produce the data with reasonable parameters so you have to put in the machinery which is chromatin modeling and transcription machinery to reproduce the data and the, the full model is on the right and you can see it's much closer for both active and inactive genes you need the machinery for active genes but not so much for inactive genes so as i mentioned you have to worry the full model worries also about the limpa lengths and this limpa lengths determines the high order chromatin structure and the fiber let me skip over that these are just some old cartoons of so-called 30 nanometer fiber so our models can go from energies free energies to densities of particles and backwards so this is a detail which allows us to take the densities from experiments and predict what the energies are and let me just show you one last thing with this uh, so there was after all so i maybe sold you on that mnas was not a good idea right to to measure what's going on with uh, with sort of DNA uh, unwrapping of nucleosomes. But John Widom worked out a very beautiful hydroxyl based high precision way of actually getting these nucleosome pieces. So which removes the MNAs uh, altogether. So you don't have that. And you can look at the, at the unwrapping as it is in yeast. So when you look at this, you actually see uh, Never mind the two curves, this is just the exposure to hydroxyl peroxide. But you basically see a huge tail below 150. So what's what's going on? And you can no longer say it's your MNAs. Uh, well, so this is consistent with something like this. It's actually the, the picture on the left is what many people had in mind. The picture on the right is what we uh, what we argued for, that they're actually partially unwrapped and crowded in at least parts of the yeast genome probably other genomes and uh, and you have a picture like this that they sort of run into each other territories and we were able to put in some unwritten potential that you see on the left and put it into our model which you know i just sketched and i didn't talk about in mathematical detail and you reproduce the histogram of of these lengths by tweaking some parameters like the slope of this uh, energy unwrapping energy on the right and the height of the oscillations in some meaningful way. I mean, uh, staying within the biophysical range of parameters because you can always overfit. So, you know, let me just mostly skip over the conclusions. I just wanted to say that the fraction of nucleosomes in the East at least, and at least, and probably everywhere else are just too close to each other, according to this data I sh I've shown you to be fully wrapped. So they basically invade each other's territories. They're probably much more dynamic than, than, than we thought. And the linkers are not always well defined in some sense, in the sense that there is a, this invasion. And also, surprisingly, wherever people tended to see uh, nucleosome free, even a nucleosome depleted regions, it's full of fragile nucleosomes. So if you look more carefully, you can actually see the transient arrays that are formed. But these guys are probably manipulated actively by uh, ATP dependent chromatin remodelers, and that's why you don't see them. So these remodelers is what we're trying to put into the model right now, and uh, uh, because it seems that they play a much more active role than than well than than some people thought, and probably they override the most of the sequence preferences that people thought was the main component. Okay, so let me just. Uh, Thank you everybody who worked with me on this project and many others over the years. And uh, well, thank you very much. Thank you, Alex, for a really, really wonderful talk. Um, I love your lab logo. That's perfect. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the, same, uh, the same student who made the, the astronomical DNA made this. He was good for that. <laughs> perfect. Um, All right. So let's see, do we have any questions that so we can do maybe one question or so um, in the official hour and then we can stop recording and and keep some discussion going more informally. 
Um, so we have one question uh, from David Lubensky. Feel free to unmute if you'd like and ask it, or I can read it. Mm -hmm. um, no, I can. I, I can read that. Okay. Uh, yeah. So so David Lubensky is asking how variable is the expression level of histones. Mm -hmm. So I believe, but I, I may be wrong, but I think that they're always uh, produced in quantity. And this is one of the most, you know, his, histones are always present at high concentration in a cell. Mm -hmm. So there is actually a very interesting question. And, and therefore, I believe the cells don't use histone concentration per se to regulate expression, meaning, you know, there are fewer hist So the whole DNA would be destabilized. It would become much more naked, if you like made uh, only a tenth of your histone octomers. But there is a super interesting question that people have started to address recently is the cell division. You know, you have to partition your histone octomers somehow. So does it go 50-50 or do you make new ones and the old ones stay, you know, as, as you make the, as you replicate DNA? So, uh, so Eric, uh, Eric is asking, does nucleosome space independent phase of the metabolic cycle in yeast? Um, no, there's no strong signal like this with high correlation, but what happens is that genes come on and off during the metabolic cycle, mm -hmm. right? And, and therefore something that had a less structured array becomes much more structured in, in tune with, with the metabolic cycle. But this is along the lines that I was describing, that the machinery comes in and, and structures the arrays, maybe override sequence signals to some extent. Uh, so genes certainly do, throughout the cycle uh, become active and inactive again, and then this follows, yeah. How does this interact with phosphorylation? Um, not very well known. Uh, is the traditionally people who try to build uh, effective models of uh, post-translational modifications and they don't talk enough probably with uh, DNA mechanics people. Um, uh, and I don't quite know, uh, this is from Juan Pedraza, and I don't know what you mean by this. Does this mean a nucleosome formation or chromatin formation? Uh, yeah, I, I, what I meant is uh, whether phosphorylation influences more wrapping and unwrapping, as is commonly believed, or whether it influences more mobility of the of the histones, as you said. Right. So uh, yeah, so the mobility is influenced also by the histone variants, right, which are probably serving as uh, binding sites, and that's that's for 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 various uh, modelers. I uh, I don't remember what's going on with phosphorylation. We haven't looked at that. So I'd have to look at the literature and you can do it. <laughs> but I would expect some effects, but maybe the correlation is low or something as always. Thank you. All right. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna officially stop the recording. Um...